so I have a very short time to make three major points uh, that I think are important to this audience as a whole. Uh, I, wanted, I used the word environmental surfing. I did not know that uh, David Briggs was a surfer, I gather, so this is an appropriate uh, focus in terms of this audience. Uh, because it's about the delight of buildings that engage the climate in which they're in. I want to make a plea to the Velux community that's in the audience. You have to spend more time in commercial buildings. Uh, the solution set is awful. Uh, we, we have stripes and bands and punched holes, and, and almost all of it is dark glass. Daylight is completely cut out. Natural ventilation is dead. I mean, we're really in it, and it's totally static and not climate responsive. So we're in, a, we're in the deep uh, holes in the, in the commercial building world, and your, need, your um, presence is critical. So environmental surfing is about looking for what the environment offers that's free in terms of comfort and quality of indoor environments. And this is the heating load in America's commercial office buildings. I know people think cooling dominates, but it does not. Uh, heating actually dominates, uh, uh, sort of challenged by lighting as the second equally most critical. And if we do deep conservation, we can cut it by a third. But it's only when we start doing conservation plus passive solar for all of our cold climates that we see that we're really uh, getting low. And if we do that, we make these incredibly delightful buildings that actually consume significantly lower energy. Uh, and we're seeing a shift slowly into uh, libraries that have completely eliminated the no notion of light and heat to libraries that are all about light and heat, such as this one in Cambridge. Our air conditioning loads are 7 by 24 by 365 in a lot of American office buildings, uh, and I know this is happening in, in Europe and Asia and, and uh, throughout the world, uh, partly because we make buildings sealed and deep, and then we have to run a system all the time. Uh, if we do deep conservation, we shade the buildings, we do uh, good insulation, we can cut it by a third, but it's only when we start to engage and embrace the notion of natural cooling, opening the doors in this room will be perfectly adequate for meeting the thermal loads of this room, um, that we start to see really low energy loads. And what you'll notice is that the system is off for more and more time. And that is resiliency. It's the ability to actually be in this building and continue to have uh, workshops, maybe not with presentation materials, but workshops even when the power is out. And with night cooling, we can cut it down to a very short time when we really would be in trouble uh, and not resilient in, in environments like, certainly like Paris and Pittsburgh, which is where I'm from. Uh, shading will cut significant amounts, and this is, of course, where the window industry has been uh, actually pretty remiss. We've gotten down to a single solution set in the window industry, which is dark glass, or uh, in many cases, low solar and low visible glass, because many architects have not realized that you can actually buy high visible transmission low solar glass. So they continue to spec low solar transmission low sol and low visible transmission as if they're bundled, which they are no longer, but they were maybe 30 years ago. And, they, and we've completely given up on external shading devices, which is really the solution set that we need to embrace architecturally. Um, if we add natural ventilation as a cooling strategy, uh, this is just a, a beautiful house uh, by Lake Flato that actually a majority of the spaces are outdoor spaces. It's a very, very small core space of conditioned, uh, air conditioned and or, and or heated uh, living, and then all the rest is flex space that ends up being usable probably about 7,000 hours out of the 8,760 in the year. Uh, if we start to design for passive cooling, we have a whole different attitude about buildings. This is a convention center in Cape Town, uh, admittedly a very mild climate, mild to hot climate, but in, in this convention center, the only things that are conditioned are the actual lecture rooms themselves. Everything else, all the public circulation, all the public meeting and, and spaces. And it's by far one of the more delightful convention centers uh, been built in the last uh, period of time. And even uh, if we look at night cooling and the ability to take uh, in environments that have a diurnal swing, to be able to take advantage of, of ventilation at night to pre-cool a lot of thermal mass, of, of course, all of you recognize the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona and, and, and the ability to actually pre-cool that with just nature so that you don't have, uh, you can absorb thousands of visitors the next day even though it's a very hot, hot uh, climate. Uh, even ventilation loads have, have grown and I know that Europe is, is at the m threshold of trying to decide if you're going to start sealing your buildings. I think this actually may be a sealed building all the operable components that were once in the skylight and the facade are no longer operable, which means we have to blow air. 
seven by 24, or at least as long as, as the occupancy is here. And that means we're not resilient. That means that when the power goes out, within an hour, we all have to be out, which is not where we want to be, because this may actually be a perfect resiliency destination when the power goes out. Natural ventilation allows us, almost every historic uh, academic institution around the world predates mechanical air conditioning, and they were very successful at educating thousands of people for hundreds of years uh, without air conditioning, and now, of course, we've, we've designed campuses in which we have to rely on air conditioning. Designing around natural ventilation is as critical, so every window has got to meet the need for daylight and the need for uh, ventilation and, and the need for views and other things that, that go along with, with the power of windows. Uh, this is a shopping mall on the right where there is natural ventilation as the dominant uh, public space in contrast to the one on the left, which has since been torn down in downtown Denver. Um, and then lighting, of course, which is a subject of the symposium, is, is a major load, although with LEDs we're seeing that go down quite a bit, and in some respects it's making people sloppy again when they have uh, the electrical loads are so small for lighting. Uh, better efficient fixtures will cut it by a third, if not a half in the case of LEDs, uh, but it's really when you get to daylight response uh, that you, and, and really designing around daylight that we can start to see the load. So the point that I'm making here is that if we surf the environment, and every environment is different. Paris is different from, from Miami, which is different from uh, Mumbai, which is different from Dubai, and we're really dealing with very environmentally uh, unique places, which makes for very exciting architecture. We're trying to basically move to an environment in which we surf outdoors for heat, for light, for air, um, for views and, and, and for physical access. And there's some amazing projects where the lights are off. And that's the sign of a very good daylight environment is that the photographs that are taken, the electric lights are turned off. That means they're balanced daylight in the, in the space. So here's where we are. This is the American commercial world across the country. Uh, an average energy load breakdown, and this is where we need to be. And this is all through environmental surfacing and, uh, surfing and deep conservation combined. And that we can meet with renewables. That we can take photovoltaic inlaid into the glass and begin to meet those loads. So if we can go from here to here through conservation and environmental surfing, we've made a huge move. So first message. Second message. We have really got to get um, the story complete. Uh, we're not making just a decision about windows. We're making decisions about entire facades. And there are at least four areas of the facade. There's the clear story, there's the view glass, there's what we call the kick plate or the Buschtung in Germany, or, and then there's a spandrel. We've got literally sets of choices that we need to make. And then there are layers. There's the external layer the, in the plane of the glass and the internal layer. And for each of those decisions, we have to actually know what our outcomes are. Are we delivering daylight? Are we delivering natural ventilation? Are we delivering views? Are we delivering heat, uh, minimized heat loss, solar contribution? And we've been trying to study what design decisions matter the most for each of those out outcomes. So if access to nature, if visually connecting people to the views with content, as Lisa was suggesting, is a, is a goal, the view plane becomes critical. And so does the kick plate area, so does the area below the window, because actually our ability to see the ground plane when you're above the second floor is dependent upon what design decision you've made in that area below the, the windowsill. Uh, if you're doing daylighting, it ends up being way up. We've got to get the clear stories right, the skylights right, and of course the view, uh, the view plane as well. And the layers inside and outside matter. If you're doing natural ventilation, the entire plane of the facade begins to play a role. If you're doing heat loss, heat gain, of course, the entire plane of the glass. If you're trying to get shading in right, but with light and air, we've got a, a very magical design set of parameters. Load balancing, we're starting to look at the facade as a way of dumping heat um, and, and maybe um, acting as a pre-cooling uh, strategy by, by venting our facades. Uh, heat and power generation, using the facade as a way to generate energy. And then, of course, water management, which often happens external to the facade before it gets into the facade plane. Uh, design for longevity and the whole story wrapped into one. Um, so ultimately, if we're going to design enclosures, and this is a hospital in Singapore, which is a 70% naturally ventilated hospital uh, with daylight as the dominant light source. Every bed has its own window that they can open uh, with a mini garden. It's a beautiful project uh, in, in, uh, in a biophilic hospital uh, in, in Singapore, one of their three. 
So the challenge is going to be, if we're going to start really designing, and truthfully, if, if Velux, with the power of their industry and the power of the excellence of their uh, building scientists, begin to look at the entire facade for the commercial world, we will be a huge step forward because we've got challenges in front of us that we haven't met. But of course, part of the reason I think Velux is not in that arena is that it's unclear whether anyone's willing to pay for a high-performance facade. Uh, we're constantly trying to dumb down the, co the commercial building uh, enclosures, uh, and we've got to find the way to pay for it. So I'm going to propose, in my third point, uh, a triple bottom line as maybe the vehicle that we can use to convince people to pay for things. It means that we do a net present value calculation for things that, that are paid for by the building owner, which is often the energy and the maintenance of the building, and that's a first bottom line calculation. And we pay for... Uh, the second bottom line, uh, trying to look at corporate decision makers who, who file CSR reports. They do corporate social responsibility reporting. They're literally sell telling the world what they're doing for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So they're reporting out their progress. And we look at the second bottom line, what we're doing for the environment for that. And then the third bottom line, what are we doing for the occupants of buildings that actually could be measured? Um, let me just take an example. If I was trying to pay for um, dynamic louvers or even static louvers, if I wanted to have a light shelf, external or internal to the facade, it almost always gets value engineered out of a building as being too expensive, unless it's aesthetically attached to the, to the architecture itself. So we're, we're going to lose ground if we don't have the arguments. So if you look at the cost of those things, I mean, this is just a quick estimate, and I have to put on my glasses to read my own slides. Maybe I can't. Oh, this way I can. Um, you know, if you're looking, it's about a $400 per employee investment, which sounds like a, a lot when you're looking at large corporate buildings. And in this case, just a small building, 50,000 square feet or 5,000 square meter building, would be, you know, a $66,000 investment. If I used energy to pay for those light shelves, I've got about um, a 35% light and energy savings only for a third of the floor plate, only for the first, you know, 10 to 15 feet or three meter uh, depth. So it would take me about eight and a half or nine years to pay it back, which is often beyond the time frame of the, of the financial decision maker. And so the light shelf is gone. And in many cases, they don't, don't actually look at net present value. The second bottom line would say, well, what if we add in the carbon value of reducing those kilowatt hours? Now, this is not the only thing that you would throw into a second bottom line calculation, but it's the one that we've chosen for the moment to calculate. What if I actually say, for every kilowatt hour I save, what if I give myself a carbon credit? What if I give myself a, a SOX and a NOX credit? What if I price it at international carbon values? And we've done that. We've put some values to every kilowatt hour saved in three continents, in the EU, in the US, and in India. And you know, it's about two cents per kilowatt hour of, of energy saved in carbon savings that we would then be able to report out as our contribution to whether it's the UN Sustainable Development Goals or, or to corporate sustainability reporting. And when we do that, we took it from the eight and a half years to six and a half years. Still might not be enough to convince someone to say, you know, let's just, let's pay for those light shelves. So then we need to look for human benefits. And of course, they're going to blow everything up. Uh, and we, well, this is just a compilation of, of w how windows and access to the natural environment and environmental surfing benefits in terms of health and benefits in terms of productivity. And you'll be happy to know that several of the presentations this morning are you know, in the database of you know, things that we could lean on, including, uh, I'll give you three of them. This one from uh, Heshang Mahone, which was their call center study, uh, which found a 6 to 7% faster average handling time, which is a metric of productivity for call centers, uh, whenever the workers had seated views of green space or of outdoors with certain visual content. Um, and you can begin to turn that, 6 to 7% is a huge financial benefit for the owner of this call center. And we do the, uh, a second one in terms of Preziosi here, a 57% reduction in six, sickness absenteeism uh, in naturally ventilated offices, and a third one, the Mariana Figuero and, and Mark Ray in the RPI study where they found that, that students who had daylight early in the morning were able to fall asleep half an hour earlier than their peers, and in process of doing that, they could wake up and become uh, more alert. So it ends with this notion that we can actually start to pay things back in less than a year. If we look at the value to the uh, occupants of those buildings, we absolutely can justify the daylight design. 
and this is one for natural ventilation. And we're happy to share these slides. Maybe they can post them on the, on the website. So triple bottom line might be our key to, to, to actually making the justification, sorry, um, for mixed mode daylight and electric light design. This is knowing we're going to need some electric lighting for the hours when it's dark. Uh, mixed mode natural cooling and mechanical cooling a whole different uh, generation of engineers, mixed mode natural ventilation and mechanical ventilation, and mixed mode living indoors and working indoors as well as living and working outdoors. Thank you.